afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, I'm a professor of biology here, and I think I've spent about 20-something years worrying about our future as an environmental scientist. And I'm going to try and get past the worry phase today and talk about the solution phase. Look up behind me here at how we get bombarded by the media with problems. Global warming, lack of food, lack of water, lack of energy, lack of money. Today's problem. Solutions to these issues, especially now I'm talking to the students here, solutions to these issues will make you famous. <laughs> you could become the next Bill Gates. I mean that. These kind of innovative thinkings for things that society really, really cares about, you'll have no trouble keeping a job. And so it's with this in mind that I want to highlight of all of the possibilities, not take the Time Magazine version up here, be worried, be very worried, no. Let's look at solutions. Let's take one of these problems and see what we can do about it. And I'm going to take food. Something we can't walk away from. We need several meals a day. Where's that food going to come from in the next 20 or 30 years? You students, when you're my age, there'll be another 2 billion people on this planet needing food. Where are we going to get that from? This is a wonderful quote from President Obama's new science advisor, who was just confirmed last week by the US Senate. And in this article, he points out that 40% of, of the people on this planet, in one way or another, use protein from the oceans. 40% of the planet, a substantial amount of their diet comes from the oceans. And actually, maybe this is the way it has been for very many thousands of years, since our civilization started. And yet, it is likely that that is going to disappear within our lifetime. So the big... 21st century question is, what are we going to do about it? Sit back and go hungry? I don't think so. Make some tough societal choices about where we get food? Yes. Here's why we are so good at fishing out the ocean. We are fantastic gatherers and hunters. And we've invented these suction techniques that literally suck the ocean dry, suck out all of the fish. And we've been really good at this, especially in the last 50 years or so, to the point that we have basically denuded most of the proteinaceous fish that come out of our oceans. As illustrated here from this United Nations graph, which shows quite nicely and sadly in some ways that we have pretty much plateaued, as shown here by this red arrow, in our ability to be hunter-gatherers of the world's oceans. That's probably going, that arrow is going to likely drop over time. And yet, if we look at our demand in this same period, it goes up and up and up and up and up. So how do we close this demand for protein from the world's oceans versus what we can steal from it or capture from it? Well, the gap has been filled by this aquaculture model. Now, I'm not proposing, as we heard from the previous speaker from Jane, that aquaculture is necessarily all good. We need a sustainable, carefully worked out scientific aquaculture if we're to close this gap. Here in the United States, we're not very good, actually, at growing our own food. That might come as a surprise to some of you. We think of ourselves as the breadbasket of the world, but in fact, if we look at this graph here, it's where we scale all the continents to their ability to produce aquatic protein, you'll see the United States is quite small. In fact, the United States is almost the size of this tiny little island, Iceland. So what we put ourselves into the position today is that we are dependent upon the good graces of others to send us food. Does this sound familiar with the oil debate today? Are we going down that same road in the future, or should we make decisions to grow our own food? And that's what I engage in. This is the great power of American agriculture, the green revolution, where we can produce vast amounts of corn and rice. Every one of you depend upon this revolution that occurred about 40 years ago. 
What I'm proposing is we're going to have to think of a second revolution. In this case, looking at the largest biosphere on the planet, which is the aquatic ocean biosphere. In other words, if we're going to feed these billions of people, we're going to have to do it in a different way. We're not going to be able to get that much more food out of our land. We're pretty much saturated where we can grow stuff. We're going to have to go to somewhere else. And that's the term called the blue revolution. Making hybrid organisms that grow fast, as illustrated here. I'm holding in my hand two oysters, which happen to be the most cultured animal on the planet in terms of tonnage on six different continents. And you'll notice one is very big and one is very small. What we're doing is we are manipulating these organisms to give us more protein from the ocean. They are the same age, they've been fed the same amount of food, and yet one can grow about five times faster. That's the hybrid revolution. We would love to know the genes behind these processes, which is what I study personally. You may want to know the genes too, because you may not want those genes. If you have this kind of metabolism, every meal you take, you'd put on way fast weight. So in human metabolism, we want to not have that metabolism. But in things we eat, we love them to have that metabolism. And that's the basis of the blue revolution. By volume, 99% of this biosphere is aquatic by volume, because the oceans are so deep. And I'll leave you with this thought that as we look to future ways to get food, we're going to have to use the blue revolution. Great visionaries have pointed this out to us, like Arthur C. Clarke pointing out that we should be called planet ocean, not planet Earth, because we are mostly an ocean planet. Think about those kinds of thoughts in ways that we are going to absolutely be essential to feed us in generations to come. Thank you very much.